Good morning. Oh, I tell you, I wanted a river dance just then. Who doesn't even know how to do the river dance? We can do an elective later on today. Fabulous. From Lynn and I, I want to say a massive thank you to all of you. You've made us feel so at home. As Steve said, I think not only as two brothers, but as two ministries, two movements, we are very much on the same page. And it's very, very exciting. I uh, am quite saddened in, in, a, in a very real sense that we have to board a plane and leave here tonight. We're leaving on a jet plane. Don't know when we'll be back again. In the words of the great prophet. But I, I hope it's soon. I hope it's soon. I'm already trying to work out where I'm going to be in 2016. Don't know if the Lord's coming back between now and then. None of us do. I do know it'll be a cloudy day. Hmm. So if you live in Britain, you could live in permanent hope. It could be any day. I really wanted today to come and sell to you my first book. But I haven't finished coloring it in. We'll leave that for another day. What a wonderful time, what a wonderful conference. And I am reminded of John's writings. He said, if you've got ears, hear what the Spirit's saying. And I think it's very clear, very loud. And uh, I'm grateful to not only the message that Steve brought, but the message that he brought on behalf of you as a movement. I, I get it. Go. And I am grateful, Timothy. That was sensational this morning. Sensational. And, and I really feel like what I want to say is going to dovetail with where we're at and what God's saying and doing right now. I'm, I'm a missionary. I'm a missionary, and so are you. I believe that mission is both down the street and around the globe. God called Lynn and I exactly today, 13 years ago, in the year 2000, we started serving in a downtown church in my city of Brisbane. I'm going to be honest with you, don't think I'm too noble, I didn't want to go there. Only a few months earlier, we'd been invited to lead a large church. Now, as you saw on that video, uh, my stunt double, Tom Selleck, and I had, had been doing youth ministry for for a long, long time, and you know, we'd reached 41, 42 years of age, and just felt like that season was coming to an end, in that form at least. And then we got invited to, uh, to talk with a group concerning leadership of a large church, and, and I, was, I felt very comfortable with leading that church. It was large, but I felt ready. It, it, it was nice. It had a big car park. It had beautiful grass and gardens and childcare facilities. It was magnificent, and, and I felt that it was God's reward for somebody like me after 20 years of eating camp food and uh, speaking to high schoolers. Just before they were about to make the appointment, I had a visit from an elder who said, we just don't think that our church would be suited by your leadership. I said, okay, have a good life. So I, my family continued to stay in this ministry called Youth Alive for about another year. One day the phone rang. It was a pastor from a church in downtown Brisbane. And he said, we'd like to talk to you about being our senior pastor. Would you come and meet with us? And it took a little while for me to even say yes because we'd been to that church only a few months earlier and it was a really bad church. In fact, it was so bad that we were there in a, in a meeting, they called it a celebration, but it was anything but. And I was speaking, 
I'd been doing a tour through high schools with a friend of mine who'd played football for our country, and, uh, and, and my two boys, I, I, I'm jealous of it. It seems like in every nation you've got to get up and show photos of your kids and your grandkids. It feels so inadequate. <laughs> We've got two boys, Alpha and Omega. That's it. <laughs> they're handsome, they're married, so I'm not even here promoting them. It's all done. <laughs> we have no grandchildren. If you do, just come and touch us. <laughs> My boys were about 12 and 9, and during what they called worship, one of my sons came and tapped me on the back. He said, hey, Dad, can I have five bucks? I said, why? He said, Jason said he'll take us to McDonald's. I said, when? He said, now. <laughs> I looked at him and said, really? He said, Dad, this is a very bad church. <laughs> I said, you're right. I gave him 10. I said, take your brother. <laughs> True story. They left. We went out with the pastor afterwards, and he says, so what do you think of my church? I said, man, it's a crock. <laughs> he said, yeah, I know, I'm leaving. <laughs> he rings us a short time later. He said, the elders would like to talk to you. So all the way down, I was Prince Charming all the way to that meeting. It was just one of, it was one of my highlights in my life, driving. I don't know who I was grumbling more to, Lynn or God. I said, Lynn, I don't even know why we're doing this. We go and sit down, we have a meal. One of the elders leans forward and says, so Wayne, tell us about your burden for our church. <laughs> I looked at him and said, oh, you're mistaken. I have no burden for your church. <laughs> I, I don't even like it. That set us off to a really good start. <laughs> but I said, I've got a burden for this city. And it's just possible that the destiny on our lives and the call of God on this church just may collide. So at least I'll pray. So we met them again. On this occasion, they, for the first time, asked, Lynn, do you have any questions? And she starts asking questions of their youth ministry and their children's ministry. The children's ministry had 14 children and the kids and the youth ministry had 12. And that was an interesting thing in itself. And the more they talked, the longer I saw Lynn's face get. We talked, we prayed, we left. Driving home, it was really quiet. I looked at Lynn and I saw a tear just here. I said, are you okay? She said, no. I said, why? She said, we're going to go there, aren't we? <laughs> then I started crying and said, yeah, I think we are. <laughs> we drove into this church. Its next door neighbors were adult stores and brothels. It was surrounded by broken people whose lives had been destroyed by all sorts of abuse. It was funny, it was just mad. We, we would arrive and we had, there was a set of traffic lights and we'd have to turn left right beside our church building. There was an adult store and at the lights was this adult store. And every, every Sunday we'd arrive, two little boys, 12 and eight, in the back seat and as we'd pull up to turn left, we, every time we'd get a red light and the boys are gone. I'd say, hey, boys, what do you think mum would look like in that? <laughs> so we started a whole new fashion range in our church. <laughs> Timothy's got restaurants, but oh, boy, we've gone to a hole. <laughs> so we started there. I went for a walk on my first day. I just shook my head. The building was covered in graffiti. The streets were covered with broken people. I went and sat at my desk. Oh God, what am I going to do? And the Holy Spirit, I shared yesterday the passage that he put in my heart the first day, and then the second day I, I really expanded 
from the whole book of Nehemiah, which became our roadmap for months. We're not going there today. But I read that chapter, one, two, three, and then we read the whole book, and then I did it again, and I did it again, preached and preached and preached out of the book of Nehemiah for, for weeks, if not months. Remember about the second or third day I read the book, I picked up my pen and I wrote across the top of the book of Nehemiah, the success of our ministry will not just be measured by the numbers of people in our meetings, but by the state of the community we're called to reach. And that's been our mandate, it's been our mission, and I'm a missionary to my city, but I also get the fact that we're called to go to the nations. We're called to bring transformation, not just salvation. Thy kingdom come. About two weeks into this mission, I remember turning to Lynn one morning and said, you know what, I'm ten times happier here than I would have been if I'd gone to the big church. And it's been just some of the greatest years of our lives. And yes, the church has grown. But for me to see the transformation of lives and of community... That's the greatest thing. But I'm going somewhere. The big point as we are at this stage of our conference and in in, in this moment of what God is saying to us, I want to make one big point. As we talk about transformation, I am so aware that I can only pass on to a broken and dying world what I've truly received. If I want to be God's agent of change, if I want to be on mission, if I want to be part of transformation and his transformational plan for my city, my nation, then it must firstly start with a personal transformation. And in this entire conference called Go, I I, I want us to to just rewind it a little moment and and just stop and, and let's look in the mirror And let's bring the whole issue of transformation back to us personally. Because personal transformation does not happen by me trying to love God more. But rather it happens when I discover how much he loves me. Listen to how John put it. 1 John 4. Verse 10, he said, this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love, not that we love God. He doesn't love me anymore if I go or if I don't doesn't love me anymore if I pray more than you. Read the Bible more or less than you. This is love. Not that I love him, but that he loves me. As I've already said, we have two sons. And as I think through the years, I don't recall once where either one of them came to me and said, Dad, I'm really worried. I said, why, son? I said, I just don't think I love you enough. Never once have they done that. They've only ever lived out a security and a confidence that comes out of a revelation that I'm loved. The security of growing in a household where unconditional love is poured upon them. I watch leaders that makes me wonder, do you get this? Because I watch them. I watch how they live. I watch how they lead. My prayer today is that there's a fresh revelation of the extravagant, unconditional love of the Father. Because when we are transformed by his love, oh, I tell you, we can truly get going on mission and transform his world in Jesus' name. Amen. There is nothing I can do to make him love me more And there is nothing I can do to make him love me less. When Jesus was asked by the 12 decibels, would you please 
teach us how to pray. He said, sure, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father. He told us to speak to our Father. We, every one of us that have studied that text at any level, know that it was a very intimate term. It's Abba, it's Dad, it's Daddy. Our Father, my Dad. And, and when I call him Father, it not only identifies him as Dad, but when I call him Father, it identifies me as a son. And I walk confident in my dad. Now I'm going somewhere, so come with me to Luke chapter 3, and we're going to really blow this out. When I know that I am living and leading, when I know that I am serving a loving father, oh, I tell you something, I have a solid foundation from which I can live and which I can lead. I know I'm loved, and that gives me security. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 3. We see a profound illustration. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. One of the classic moments where all three members of the Trinity are evident in one point, in moment, graphically. Luke chapter 3. Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist, not Tom the Episcopalian. Episcopalian is John the Baptist, his cousin. He goes to the Jordan. He's being baptized. Remember this story. Luke chapter 3, verse 21, verse 22. Here's what happens. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, here we go. The Son of God is in the water being baptized. As he's praying, heavens open. And the Holy Spirit descends on him in a bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven comes saying, You are my son with whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Catch that again. The voice came. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Pleased, Jesus being baptized, the Holy Spirit anointing him for ministry. We're talking a lot at the moment about the anointing and the help of the Holy Spirit. How many know we need the help of the Holy Spirit? The anointing is the key to his power. I might not have much, but what I have, I give. What do I have? I have the authority of the name and I have the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But I'm here today to tell you, you need more than that. The Holy Spirit is coming on Jesus like in the form of a dove. And I know a whole lot of ministries that have got a good handle on the dove. But I think again, they need to hear the voice of the Father. And what did he say? You're my son, whom I love, in whom I am Well pleased. What did Jesus hear his dad say? He heard his dad say what every child wants to hear their dad say. I love you and I'm proud of you. I love you and I'm proud of you. Every one of us want to hear that. Some of us have grown craving those words. I love you. And I'm proud of you. Lynn and I feel very rich people. We're still doing life. Both sets of our parents, for both of us, are still alive. They're both in our church. My dad and I still do a few things together. He turns 86 in a couple of weeks. And he and I have the same gap in age, almost 30 years, to me and my oldest son. We recently stood on a stage, and the three of us, and I looked at my son and I realized how quickly the years go. I thought, my goodness, yesterday I was you. And tomorrow. <laughs> I'm 55 years of age. I'm pastor of this wonderful church and wonderful ministry. But you know what, even in my age, Pastor Steve's been to my church a number of times. He can find my dad real easy. He's the only guy in the building with a suit and tie on. He sits in the tiered section, third row up on the right-hand side. 
And there are some days as a 55-year-old. I'm preaching, I look up at my dad and he goes. <laughs> and I look at the rest of them and think, I don't care what you think. <laughs> I love you and I'm proud of you. My oldest son has played both boys. Our boys have played a lot of sport. My oldest son's still doing particularly well. And he plays a game which many of you don't understand. It's called cricket. It's basically baseball played properly. <laughs> All the brothers from the Commonwealth. He's 26 years of age. Self-contained Aussie guy. And at that level and the, the, the level he plays at, you don't run out and make a fuss. But he knows when we're at the game and he just looks out to be outfielding and this is how it goes. <laughs> you know what that means in Australian? Thanks for coming, Dad. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and I'll go. <laughs> you know what that means? I love you. And I'm proud of you. And some of us, you see, I, my prayer, here's my prayer, is that many of us in this room, this clock just dropped from 40 minutes to 15. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We've taken the clock out of our church. We've put up a calendar. <laughs> Not true. I respect it. Jesus. Anointed. Thank God for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's not by might or by power. It's by His Spirit. I get that. I'm a Pentecostal. I'm so filled even my teeth are filled. I get all that. I get that. I need him, I believe in him, but you know what? There's a lot of people running around doing ministry that get the dove but haven't heard the voice. And they've got power, but they're not secure. Ever jumped into a car with a V8 without a decent set of brakes? Jesus got about life, very secure in who he was. There were times that they said he had a devil. There were times they said he had a devil. There were times he, they said he was a devil. There were times that he, they said he was crazy, he was a lunatic. They made all sorts of accusations against him. But you know what? His identity, his self-worth, and his security have found their source in the love of a father, not the comments or any response from any human force. And if you haven't discovered that yet, and I'm, I'm very aware there are different levels of leadership in this room, but you're all leaders, every one of you. You haven't discovered this yet in life. You will soon. Put this one in the bank. You better discover who you are, and you better form your identity on what he says, not what they say. There'll be days they cry, Hosanna, and there'll be other days they cry, Crucify. He was so secure, he just kept walking. Hmm. I remember when Lynn and I were still in our mid-twenties, I guess, and we became the pastors of our first church. Oh, man, that was a gig. We didn't have a clue. Every Sunday, I'd drive home thinking, That's, I've just told them the last thing I know. <laughs> and I'd pray... Prayers through trembling lips. Jesus, I don't know when you're coming back, but this week suits me. <laughs> the night they made us the pastors, they, they had us kneel down. There was a photo of the night we became pastors. Had us kneel down, they laid hands on us, and they prophesied. At the end of the meeting, my dad came up and shook my hand and said, it's wonderful, son, to see you a leader. He said, let me tell you something. They only put you out in front to get a better shot at you. You better know who you are. 
I love you, and I'm proud of you. Once you get that, you're unshakable. Can we just for a moment flip this and, and look at the reverse of what happens when you don't have your security and the love of your father? If I don't know who I am, I, I search for my identity in all the wrong places. It's terrible to see people who don't know who they are. Oh, it's awkward. Lynn and I went to my sister's 50th birthday a little while ago. It was a 50s theme. All the old 50s cars and you name it. And, and, and they had an Elvis impersonator there which was okay for a few minutes, but it just went on <laughs> and on. And as the night progressed, it dawned on me, we all know he's not Elvis, <laughs> but he doesn't. <laughs> and it got really awkward. Makes me wonder how many people are sitting in church going, Elvis? I discovered the one thing about my heavenly father. He has created me to be me and he wants to release me to be me and bring honor and glory to his name as me. And, and, and I can only do that when I am secure in who I am. Anointed and affirmed. Anointed and affirmed. If I don't know who I am, I search for my identity in all the wrong places. Symbols and titles which are, are all external and are only temporary. We make too big a deal on it. Hey, hey, leaders, get your degrees, get your PhDs. It's important that we, we, we can articulate clearly truth and, and get all you can, and, and we honor you for what you've achieved. But can I tell you something? The more we celebrate the titles and the stuff, you know what? The greater we create a separation between us and the people we're trying to reach. I get two-year-olds in my church that call me Wayne. It's because it's my name means wagon maker. <laughs> Write that down. I came to a conference here in the US two years ago, and they put in, every time I went to a function, they'd have as my name tag, the Reverend Dr. Wayne Alcorn. Took it home. I actually grabbed one of the place cards. Took it home. Linda said, "You need to show me more respect, woman." Just <laughs> call me Reverend Doctor. If I don't know who I am, I'll, I'll actually become too enamoured with that stuff. The stuff. I, I respect all the offices and the and the gifts that Christ has given to His church, celebrated in Ephesians 4. But you know what? I'm actually okay if we don't go putting all those titles on ourselves. By the fruit, we'll know it anyway. We'll just know it. We'll just know it. If you're an evangelist, start winning souls. If you're a prophet, prophesy. Just do it. Do it. Hmm. If I don't know who I am and, and I'm searching for that identity in that stuff, hear me, leader, other people's opinions will matter too much. I'll be flattered by their praise and flattened by their criticism. And life will be a roller coaster. Let's just be secure in who we are. I love you and I'm proud of you. Here's another thought. If I don't know who I am, I distort reality. We were being reminded earlier in this conference about the spies that went out. I, I just don't even get this story. They're obviously sensational leaders. I mean, out of all the tribes and clans, 12 were chosen to represent a whole nation, and yet they came back and 10 to 2, the positive versus the negative report. They're outnumbered, the good guys. And, and they said... We can't take a land, which, which blows me away, because God said, go look at a land I've given you. God's already given them the land. He said, go and get the land that I, go check it out that I've already given you. So it was a done deal. But they come back and say, we know what God said, but we can't take it because we, you should see it. 
We saw them, and then when we saw them, we saw ourselves. They're giants, and we're grasshoppers. Now, the, the, the line that blows me away in the story of those spies is they said, we, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes and in ours. In their eyes? Did they go and ask them? I distort reality. I, I, I've had a number of people say to me, are you going to preach the faith message again today? I don't know if there's any other message. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And you know, when we get to Hebrews 11, the very last verse before we get to Hebrews 11, I, I find interesting in Hebrews 10, 38, it says, don't throw away your confidence. Because in it, you'll have great reward. Pastor Steve and I are interested in the game of tennis. And I've never seen somebody walk off Wimbledon or the U.S. championships ever having won a game when they say to them, was there ever a time that you thought you'd lose? I've never heard, yeah, or the whole game I thought I'd lose. <laughs> Even when their backs were against the wall, they were down two sets and looked a service break against them. They said, there was still something in me that said I can win. Don't cast away your confidence. Where's your confidence? It's not just in going to some self-improvement class and, and, you know, chanting all the right things. No, no, my confidence comes out of a security that my dad says he loves me and he's proud of me. And if you're serving in a small country town or whether you're serving in a mega city, whether your church has got dozens or thousands, he still loves you and he's still proud of you. He's anointed you to serve and he loves watching you do it. He says you're the apple of his eye. Yes, That's why we can walk knowing he's the glory and lifter of my head. See, I'm having a good time right now because I don't really care whether you like this or not. Because <laughs> my heavenly father, he loves me. Here's the tragic one. If I don't know who I am, as much as I want to transform my city and I want to go I don't know who I am. I damage relationships. Wow. Have you ever seen insecure people in relationships? It's terrible. They, they interpret disagreement as rejection. Wow. Lynn and I have just celebrated 31 years of marriage. Whew. If disagreement was going to end our relationship, we wouldn't have got home from the honeymoon. Have you ever seen the way God just loves to take people that are different? How many are in a relationship where one of you is an owl and the other one's a fowl? The morning people and the night people. That's Lynn and I. Lynn is, Lynn is a, a, a school teacher and, and, and she's structured and ordered. She's got this thing about life, everything in its place, a place for everything and everything in its place. I'm unstructured, I'm spontaneous, I've got a thing in life, if you're going to use it the next month, put it somewhere, you'll find it. <laughs> and God puts these two people together and goes, ha ha, let the games begin! <laughs> but when people are secured, you, you know what? Disagreement can actually bring clarity. So what I love about the leadership of this movement, there, there's people with different personalities and different insights. But when you get together, there's a sharpening. Oh, we don't want to be... Have you ever been around people? Everybody's a clone. Oh, <laughs> awkward. Everybody's just doing karaoke instead of singing their own song. Being themselves. See, I don't feel any pressure to stand up here and try. Timothy was brilliant this morning. But I don't feel any pre pressure on me to stand up right now and preach the same way he did, with a Malaysian accent. <laughs> you would look at me going, get back on your medication. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, man, he is brilliant. I've got to follow this. Oh, oh. But you know what I heard my father say? 
I love you. A little more than him. And, <laughs> and I'm proud of you. got four children. <laughs> Quality, not quantity. <laughs> I really plan to be serious this morning. <laughs> okay, here's, here's the deal. How can I be fully used to transform my city until I've been fully transformed by his love? There'll be too many handbrakes. There'll be too many things that get in the road. And my prayer is that during this time together, there's just that fresh revelation of the Father heart of God and that you're found in his love. Leaders... Leaders, please, if you don't get this, this will affect your ministry. And insecurity manifests itself in all sorts of ways, which they can have tragic, tragic influences and outcomes in your ministry. Leaders that are insecure become control freaks. We think they're strong, but they're really bullies. They live life with this sense of entitlement because the stuff affirms them. They're erratic. Go to a conference and it's this theme, so they take the whole church and say, God's spoken to me and whoa! It's end times, that's what it is, it's end times. No, it's, it's the river, whoa! It's faith, it's discipleship. It's a, and, and, and the whole time the whole church has gone, whoa! We've got seasick churches because they're led by insecure leaders. Get a revelation. Here's what God said to Moses. Do everything according to the pattern I've shown you. Now I glean from Steve and every nation. Man, I'm like a vacuum around this. I love it. But I'm not going to go home and shave my head. You talk like Steve Murrell. I, I can't do it. <laughs> Got to do what I'm called to do. And he, it's sad, you know, when, when I don't know who I am, I, I just never fully engage with the people I'm called to reach. Because I, I know my flaws, and I just keep you a little further away. In case you get too close, you're going to see stuff. And I want you to be impressed by my Elvis costume. I don't want you to get too close and see the real me. And it's tragic. I, I said yesterday that I believe the kingdom of God advances along lines of meaning for relationship. I believe also that it advances along lines of generations that have been set up for success, which I hear you doing. But into that, can I add a voice? The Bible says we've got 10 thousand teachers but not many fathers and let me be somewhat prophetic in saying the future of every nation will depend on how much a generation gets the father heart of God and gets properly fathered into their destiny we need it I've got a number of our family members are school teachers and they come home and they say, you know, it, it, it's mad, Dad. See, when I grew up as a kid, if you saw somebody in your classroom that was the child from a divorced family, say, see that kid there, they're from a divorced home. Now they say, see that kid there, their parents are still together. 
And into that, we've got a minister. And out of that, we're raising leaders. And, and there's people getting through life. And they love God. And he's put his gift and his talent and his anointing on them. They know the dove. But they need to also hear the voice of the Father. Because otherwise, we're going to get people caught in the performance trap. Doing stuff. Thinking that he's sitting there measuring and marking how we do this gear. And he's not doing that at all. He loves us just the way we are. He wants to take us from glory to glory. I get that. But he loves us. One of the things that when God called us out of the ministry of Youth Alive, he spoke to my heart one day and said, you've spent a long time helping teenagers. Now I want you to help their fathers help them. See, it says in Psalm 68, that our God, who we've been worshipping so wonderfully here today, says, says he takes the solitary and he puts them into families. That's what's happening here. Catch his heart. He's a father to the fatherless. He sets us free. I love you. You want to go deeper? You can't go any deeper than this. You can't make him love you anymore. And you can't make him love you any less. That's as deep as it gets. And today, I'm just going to ask the team. My time's up. I may not get an opportunity to say thank you personally to Steve and Deborah and your wonderful team. I love them. I honor all of you and we feel enriched by being with you. Look forward to further fellowship. But I believe in this moment God wants to speak and he wants to do some things. And I respect the clock. I think we're all kind of a little bit of loss as to where we're at right now, but I won't take it. I won't take it more than a couple of minutes. We've already sensed that anointing. So wonderfully reminded already about the power of the Holy Spirit. But can I also add to that? the power of his unconditional love. And I know God's been speaking to some people here today. I, I, at, at my men's conference, I, 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 I said this recently. I showed a picture of, some of you are aware of Rick and Dick Hoyt. Dick Hoyt, a, a, a mature age man who's got a son who's, who's got all sorts of terrible physical disabilities. And yet he loves sport. So his father, in his mature age, like 60 plus, with a heart operation already behind him started doing things like the Hawaiian ultra marathon the Iron Man in Hawaii swimming and running and cycling like through day and night all the time towing and pushing his crippled son and I showed that image and I said to a whole bunch of big tough Aussie guys I said some of you are looking at that young man there with his crippled body and you'd exchange your big strong muscular frame for that body just to know the love of a father like that and as I said it tears began to stream down the faces of people just, I, just, I just want to once hear my dad say I love you and I'm proud of you and today there's something happening in the hearts of some people. You just want to say, God, maybe because of what's happened in our family when we were growing up, maybe some stuff that's happened, let's call it rejection. We're doing life and feeling just a little bit alone and what God's been saying to us today, maybe with the words from my lips or maybe at the same time the Holy Spirit's been saying other things to us. But you're saying, God, you've been speaking to me today. I'm grateful. I know I'm anointed. But I'm somebody that says, you know what, I don't just need teachers. I'm somebody that needs the affirmation of a father. If I'm speaking to you right now. I don't care whether you're 21 or 81. I want you to stand to your feet. It won't be, it won't be everybody. But it will be dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people. There are. There are. There's no shame in this. This is a healing moment. talking to men, I'm talking to women. Until you get this, it's going to be some little anchor you're dragging in ministry. The minute you understand the love of a father, the father. Now to every nation, I want to remind you, 
10,000 teachers, you've got magnificent preachers and teachers in this movement. Apostles and prophets, evangelists, phenomenal. But the next generation needs a dad. And I want people to stand up now. And until somebody comes and stands and puts their, shoulder, their hand on your shoulder, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask mums and dads in the faith to now stand and go and stand with somebody. Preferably somebody of your own gender. And I want you to pray the grace of God on them. Raise your hand until somebody comes to you. You've got your hand up until somebody comes to you. And I want you to pray the healing work of God. I want you to pray that their heart Listen to the Apostle Paul pray. He says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. I want you to pray a revelation of the Father heart of God upon these dear people that are sitting here right now, standing here today with their hand. And if someone hasn't come to you, put your hand up. I need you to keep walking. Mums and dads in the faith, get out of your seat. There's people still down there hanging out, craving that a mum or a dad is going to come and love on them right now. I want you to find someone wherever they are, across the room. Come and help them. Come and pray for them. They're still there. Come on. This is the time for you to be a minister. This is time for you to be an agent of grace and healing love in Jesus' name. Come and pray. Come and pray. And as they do, you just pray. This team's going to just worship God. And I just pray the release of the healing work of God. Just flow in Jesus' name. Keep walking. Walk right to the back. Some of them need you right now. Not a teacher. They need a father. They need a mother in the faith to just love them and say, we love you and we're proud of you. In the name of Jesus.